Now I'd like to turn to the uh, incretin mimetics as a class of drugs um, that are used by injection for improving insulin uh, secretion and to some extent sensitivity. The incretins include and these will be the ones that are mainly um, discussed physiologically and pharmacologically, are GLP-1 or glucagon-like peptide, which is a 31 amino acid um, peptide produced by the L cells of the intestine, and the glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptide, GIP, a 42 amino acid um, peptide produced by the K cells. GLP-1 is actually produced by the L cells um, from proglucagon, and in these L cells, basically, the product is GLP-1 and 2, and GLP-1 is the incretin that we'll focus on. And these drugs, this, this peptide, will stimulate insulin secretion and beta cell growth. Um, the same machinery uh, in, in the A cells of the islets of Langerhans will produce glucagon and glucagon-related polypeptide. In the K cells, the pre-pro uh, GIP peptide uh, is cleaved to form a 42 amino acid uh, GIP. So what do these incretins do? They sense the type and quantity of digested nutrients in the gut. And they are essentially pre preparatory signals to uh, organs like the pancreas and the brain with regards to the um, production or in, of insulin and also the glucose availability. In the pancreas, the main effect is to increase insulin, uh, the sensitivity of the beta cell to the stimulatory effect of glucose. And the, this basically, the easiest way to remember what incretins do is the difference that we see between an IV glucose tolerance test, which has a lower area under the curve, compared to an oral glucose tolerance test, uh, which tends to in, involve the incretin effect. So, in humans, although we don't do this a lot in animals, in humans, um, if you're suspected of having uh, insulin, um, some pre-diabetic pre condition, such as in during pregnancy or otherwise, you will be given an oral load of glucose in order to test the entire axis, if you will, of both the this, this tendency for the beta cell to produce insulin, as well as this incretin effect to enhance that. Uh, it turns out in the cat, only 30% of the rise in insulin concentration is related to the incretin effect after an oral glucose load. So the, the, the differential between an IV and an oral glucose tolerance test in a cat, although they're rarely done, uh, would theoretically be much less. Um, and this may be because um, glucose doesn't stimulate uh, GIP secretion in cats. Now we're going to focus our attention on GLP-1 analogs because these are the ones that have been studied uh, primarily in human medicine, but also now a little bit in veterinary medicine, specifically for the cat. Uh, so what does GLP-1 do? It's produced by uh, the cells of the intestine, and it has an effect on the brain to reduce uh, appetite, and it has some neuroprotective effects. It tends to reduce gastric emptying. In the GI tract, the most importantly, when we think about its effects on, on the beta cells of the pancreas, uh, also the alpha cells, in that they increase the insulin secretion, they increase beta cell production, uh, cell uh, neogenesis or uh, division, they reduce their apoptosis, and they tend to reduce glucagon secretion. So you can see this is the net hypoglycemic effect. On the muscle, as a result to this increased insulin secretion, you have increased glucose uptake. In the liver, due to the increased insulin, you have a suppression of hepatic glucose production. 
Uh, in addition, there's this, uh, the mechanism is, uh, I'm not going to discuss, uh, uh, a cardioprotective effect on the heart and also tends to increase cardiac output. Now, this uh, slide is basically um, meant to tell you that these are G -co protein coupled receptors. So the GLP-1 binds to its receptor on the beta cell, and through a G-coupled system, it will stimulate the protein kinase A and something called EPAC, which is the exchange protein directly activated by cyclic AMP that stimulates potassium-dependent ATP. You might notice this was the target of, of glipizide, um, and it leads to the voltage-sensitive uh, increase of calcium intracellularly, um, stimulation of ryanidine receptors, and uh, improvement of insulin secretion. So through this mechanism, this G-protein-coupled me mechanism, GLP-1, will stimulate insulin secretion. I thought it would be useful to talk a little bit about the uh, main inf influence of incretin on uh, various events associated with glucose uh, up uptake, uh, absorption, and also um, decline in the blood in different species. I'm going to focus on the human, the dog, and the cat because these are the species uh, that we know, we know the most about the human, and we, of course we deal with the dog and the cat. Um, so let's take a look at uh, meal ingestion. Um, carbohydrate seems to be the main stimulus uh, for GLP-1 uh, in the human, whereas amino acids and possibly lipids in the dog are more important for incretin effects in um, <clears throat> those species. The release of GLP-1 takes place in all species from the L cells, uh, with perhaps some from the pancreatic alpha cells, where we think about glucagon being produced, but in this case, the rat and the mouse. In all species, you see, this is key, increased insulin, reduced glucagon as a result of the, uh, in the pancreatic islets, as a result of stimulation of, so let's say, GLP-1 or GIP. And the main effect of, on insulin is, in most cases, the release, improving the release of insulin. In the dog, it seems to be an increased sensitivity to insulin. The cat is increased release. In all cases, um, the reduction of blood glucose is the net effect. So why is this drug being used, this drug class being uh, used in type 2 diabetes? Well. You can see that in type 2 diabetes human patients, GLP-1 prosperandially is reduced compared to the normal glucose tolerance or those that are mildly insulin intolerant. So you can see that, that um, GLP levels are deficient in type 2 diabetes. And this study in cats basically shows the same thing in obese cats. Um, the obese cats have less GLP-1 in response to a glucose load um, compared to the lean cats. So let's talk a little bit about the pharmaceutics of, of these products. Um, these need to be injected. They're peptides. So um, they are the ones that are developed. The analogs tend to be resistant to the dipeptopeptidase 4 which we'll talk about later as actually an, the antagonist to that is our class of drugs that can stimulate GLP-1 endogenously. Um, these agonists are the biggest and the most widely used of GLP-based drugs. You can see them advertised on TV all the time now. In fact, they've now been adopted as weight loss drugs inappropriately um, by movie stars. <laughs> and so... Um, all of these, as I said, need to be given inje by injection. Uh, they have various degrees of length of action. Other types of delivery systems, including enteral, pulmonary, and sublingual, are, are in the works. Uh, but the drug that's used the most and has been studied in the cat the most, xenotide, um, 
has a half-life of 20 minutes in the cat versus three to four hours in NAND. So you can see right there uh, one of the issues that we're facing with applying this drug to a species of interest, the cat. Um, and there are also under development some um, GLP-1 receptor agonists that aren't peptidic, meaning that they would have a tendency to be um, more, <clears throat> more resistant to a breakdown by the peptidases. So in anticipation of talking about this drug, uh, GLP-1 analog exenatide or bieta uh, in cats, let's talk about what it does in humans. Uh, it tends to reduce hemoglobin A1C, a good thing. It tends to preserve beta cell function, promote weight loss. That's why they've been um, attracted the interest of people who are trying to lose weight. And it corrects many of the known pathophysiological defects of type 2 diabetes without hypoglycemia. And therefore, it has a fairly uh, good, and excellent actually, safety uh, profile uh, in humans. Turning to cats, Senatide and its extended release product have been studied. Uh, placebo control studies have, in diabetic cats have been used in combination with glargine insulin and low carbohydrate diet. In that study, no significant effect on glycemic control or remission rates were found, although the cats did lose more weight and required less insulin on exenatide than on placebo in one of the studies. So perhaps it was the duration of the study. The extended release senatide lowered the variability of uh, glu uh, glucose um, changes during the day or glycemic variability compared to baseline and compared to a placebo group. And these cats tended to, uh, compared to a baseline and a placebo group, um, those cats with reduced glycemic variation tended to achieve remission, although much great, more study needs to be done uh, on all of these products. So in this slide, what I want to do is summarize all of the products that have been used in the cat and a little bit about them. Zenotide, uh, which is the base drug, has a short half-life in cats. Um, twice a day administration um, led to significant weight loss, but the practicality of that, of course, is an issue. It has potential for nausea and vomiting. The extended release product, um, a single injection, uh, can improve glycemic control for over a month without significant side, of, side effects uh, and also not a lot of weight loss. Uh, a little more limited experience is out there with loraglutide or Victoza, uh, which has a medium duration of about with a half-life of about 12 hours in the cat and has significant GI side effects, but there really haven't been any long-term placebo studies um, and with the GI side effects, there was significant weight loss. What was the reason? It's hard to tell. To be complete, um, talking about uh, GLP-1 um, agonism, if you will, uh, there are the dipeptidyl peptidase 4 or DPP-4 um, drugs that uh, basically inhibit the peptidase that degrades GLP-1. And these are also out there uh, used quite commonly in human medicine, and you'll see them advertised on TV as well. Anything that lends with the glyptin are inhibitors of DPP-4. These tend to be used in combination with other drugs and type 2 diabetes in people, but right now there's very little evidence to support their use in cats. One little note of caution, although perhaps it's a, um, not going to be an issue in our, our patients, uh, but it has been determined that GLP-1-based therapies um, have led to an increased incidence of pancreatic and thyroid cancer in man. Um, whether the duration and uh, time and experience and the application in our species uh, builds up to this level um, is hard, hard to know. Um, this has now been known for over a decade. So in this slide, what I want to do is summarize the drugs that uh, 
we'll talking we've been talking about with regards to non-insulin drugs uh, being used to treat diabetes and again mostly in the cat so what is shown here in the bright colors are the various pathophysiological changes um, that one has in diabetes type 2 diabetes particularly decreased glucose uptake uh, obviously, hyperglycemia, impaired insulin secretion, and increased hepatic glucose production. And so the drugs that tend to address each of these problems are listed. So improvement of insulin secretion, um, the uh, GLP-1 agonists or the inhibitors to DPP-4, or the sulfonylureas, improved uh, uptake of glucose, the thiazolidinediones, and the drug metformin or biguanide and drugs that tend to, to improve um, or reduce, I should say, hepatic glucose production include the biguanide, metformin, and thiazolidine diones. And then it's sort of its own uh, impact on Hyperglycemia are the drugs that are the SGLT2 inhibitors that increase glucose excretion, but we do know that the reduction of hyperglycemia has all kinds of secondary effects, uh, such as the improvement of um, turnover of lipids, uh, and that's why it sometimes can cause uh, increased ketone production. But uh, these are all the various strategies that are used uh, either separate from or in addition to uh, insulin when one is trying to treat um, a diabetic.